Hola, I'm uh, very thrilled to be here today, and uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, I'm going to try to figure out how, how to make this a little more joyful than uh, it's been so far uh, in terms of looking at the positives um, as well as just the negatives. Um, because I think that what fundamentally, um, you know, family is really about the joy. And I think that I have this weird belief that over time, I think, you know, this idea of the family as the center of society is so compelling that it will over time win out. Um, but sometimes demographics seems to be in a contest with economics to see who could be the dismal science. Um, but we're going to try to look at some of the positives as well. Now, what we're approaching now is something that we never expected, which is a population implosion. Uh, they, those of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s were very much uh, informed by the idea of, a, uh, of the uh, population bomb and the idea that we would have this ever-expanding population and we would run out of food. And, you know, of course, you know, we've had the idea of peak oil and then peak food and uh, peak everything, and it turned out not to be the case, in part because population growth actually slowed. Now, why is that happening? And I'm going to de uh, deal with some of the issues that have been dealt with before, but some other ones that where maybe it, they, there are things that we can do policy-wise. One is rapid urbanization, high density, and ultra-expensive housing. Now, this comes out of our research from my, I uh, fortunately have the funding both from um, from the Amundsen family and from the uh, Civil Service College of Singapore. So much of this research was done in Singapore. Um, and I think what's happening in Asia, which has been alluded to, is extraordinarily important. And there, it seems that urbanization, high density, and ultra expensive housing is a very, very big factor on why people decide not to have children. Second, the decline of spiritual commitment is clearly part of it. But I would say it would go beyond religion to the whole notion of, of the self and what matters, um, not just you know, narrowly religiously based, but also at, of what we are as human beings. And I also would say that we have a problem with hyper-competitive economics. Capitalism is both a solution and a cause of problems. And one thing that came up in our discussions in Singapore particularly is people felt so compelled to work such long hours that they felt they could not have children even if they wanted to. And lastly, something that I think is particularly um, relevant here in Spain and throughout Europe, but is also very, very important increasingly in the United States and even in East Asia, is the perception of younger people that the future will be worse than the past and that they will not have children because they do not think that they would be able to raise them properly. Now, obviously, urbanization is taking place. About half of the world population is living in cities. Um, in 1800, it was about 1%. So we're really talking about very different ways that people live. What we find consistently is the, is the more densely populated areas, the inner city has much lower birth rates than the outer city. And you can see this, um, for instance, in London. Um, you can see this as well in Japan. Now, Japan is a special case because the world that we're about to see, if we don't make some changes, is now becoming very clear in Japan. There's no question that the demographic implosion that Japan is going through is both a symptom of problems and a cause of them. Um, we can see now in many parts of Japan, particularly in the Tokyo area, about 30 to 35 percent of women uh, do not have children. Um, and in many cases do not get married. In, in East Asia, generally speaking, if you, um, there, you don't have the phenomena of people having children outside of wedlock. That's not the problem in East Asia. It's the decision to stay, to stay single or in some cases get married without children. But throughout Asia, we're finding extraordinarily high degrees, about 30% of women in Taiwan, um, we're getting there in coastal China of women deciding never to get married, never to have children. That will be uh, something that will have enormous long-term impact on our societies. The other thing, of course, is density. Um, I would argue that if we thought about how we could make our smaller towns and cities as well as our suburbs more attractive, 
we, we would encourage the formation of families much more. In other words, the, the race to get small space and spend a lot of time it, um, getting it makes it very, very difficult. I was in Korea when I learned this. I went to a Buddhist monastery and I asked the, uh, the monk in charge, I said, why are Koreans who had a very high birth rate not having children? And he said, because by the, you, you work till you're 40, 45 to get an apartment, you have to take the train 45 minutes uh, to get into Seoul. There's simply no energy left to produce babies. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And again, you can see the more unaffordable. So it's not just density itself, it's affordability. In much of East Asia, housing costs are three to four times higher than they are even in a place like the, like the UK. So as housing becomes harder to purchase, people make what is essentially a rational decision not to have children because they can never have enough space to raise them properly. And as you can see, this is also happening uh, in the United States. The percentage of people um, who are never married, women who are never married, after all, you know, we have to know who's important here. Um, in 1960, it was 15%. We always had people never, who never got married and women who were, you know, there was a, a culture for that. But now we're talking about 28% in the United States of people who were never married. We can see childlessness um, has gone from about 10% in the United States in 1976. Uh, overall childlessness now to about 20, other than never having children. So what we're seeing over time is a rise in this, in this pattern, um, and that has, obviously has some big implications. And again, in, in East Asia, again, the same pattern. And again, I would argue that what's happening in East Asia, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in the coastal cities of China is probably the most important demographic development on the planet today since that's where a most of the economic growth is and where the largest populations in the world are um, and if that phenomena of childlessness becomes 30 40 percent its long-term impact on the global economy and global demographics will be profound now we can see some of this in fertility rates uh, the fertility rates um, have been dropping all over the world. Um, the one exception of, uh, in the advanced countries that stayed at replacement rate is the United States of America. I think there are lots of reasons for that. One is we, um, the United States is about 60% of the population think religion is important. Most other advanced countries it's about 15%. Um, we are a predominantly suburban nation. People have single family homes. And despite everything, Americans, for whatever reason, tend to be optimistic. Um, you can see what's happening in other countries, Singapore, Japan, China, uh, going well below um, replacement. Interestingly enough, in China, the one-child policy was part of it, but in areas in the Chinese-speaking world where there, are, um, where there is no one-child family, we actually have, uh, we have getting to be lower birth rates. Hong Kong, by some estimates, is below one, and Hong Kong doesn't have the, uh, the one-child um, family. Um, again, Europe, of course, it was um, early in doing this, and you can see basically convergence uh, in Europe of very, very low fertility rates. Now, religion, as, uh, as Mr. Mueller talked about, is very, very much a part of this. There's no question that one of the reasons Americans have more children is we have more people who are either evangelicals, Mormons, uh, re religious Jews, whatever they are, they tend still to have somewhat larger families. Um, as religion fades, as Europe's Christianity begins to go into a very serious um, problem for itself, that is going to have an impact. And the decline of religions um, in East Asia as well. Um, and again, you can see within the United States, we have vast differences in the birth rates even between regions. For instance, Salt Lake City, which is predominantly uh, Mormon, has a much higher birth rate. Uh, so do most of the places in what we call the Bible Belt in the South, compared to, let's say, New York, San Francisco. You know, San Francisco is famous as a city where there are now more dogs than children. Um, and uh, in some ways, dogs have better rights. Um, so what are the implications of low fertility? You know, 
in a lot of ways, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, you, know, you Los Angeles, you know, we don't, you know, we have four million people. If we had two million people, kind of be nice. Except that what happens is people don't have the courtesy to die young enough. And so we have population decline and accelerated aging. World populations are going to age, but how rapidly? The growing burden of support, um, how there are now uh, fewer and fewer workers to support the aging population. And that, I believe, frankly, is a big part of what's happening in Europe and is certainly part of the longer term uh, fiscal crisis in the United States. Um, and by the way, even in Singapore, which has a very good savings plan, they now admit that their savings plan will not cover their population because of the aging. And long-term economic stagnation. And this is kind of a vicious cycle because what happens is your population ages, your economy slows down, innovation slows down, and therefore uh, people decide the future isn't good so they're not going to have children. So obviously we've got to figure out a way out of this. Now, we have started to do models um, at Chapman University um, where we're saying we believe the UN um, projections are, are wrong, that they are much, that the population um, in the developed world will be considerably lower than projected because of all the people who are, e are either remaining single or childless throughout their lives. Um, there are insane ideas that by 2050 or 2070, Japan will go back to 2.1, and I keep asking why. And of course, one problem, people who uh, don't have children, guess what, they don't have grandchildren either. Um, so we think that the UN projections are just literally insane. Um, and we're going into something much deeper than, our, than, than is being predict, predicted. Now, what this means is you're gonna have many societies where the percentage of the population uh, over 60 is going to be uh, considerably higher. We're talking about China going from uh, around 10% to 25%. You see the same things in, um, obviously, Italy, you're talking about 38% of the population over 60. How that's sustainable, I don't know. These dependency ratios, they'll tell you a little bit about what, what is going on. You can see the dependency ratios of Singapore. This is why Singapore is so interested, interested in all this. Um, all these dependency ratios, in other words, the population over 65 per 1,000 of working age. If you take a look at the Singapore population pyramid of 2030, there will be more people in their 60s than there will be under 15. That's, we just, this is a whole new definition of the human condition. And this is for Spain, very similar kind of bulge that exists in Spain. So you're going to see 2030 in a world where there are more gray hairs than, than young kids. Um, I think this is unprecedented. We used to have rural communities that are like this. Now we have whole nations that are like this. Now this has a huge effect economically. If you look at 15 to 64, between 2000 2050, the workforce in the United States will grow about 37%. It will decline, it'll start declining in China. Around 2030, it'll be minus 10%. Europe, minus 21%. Korea, minus 30%. Japan, minus 39%. And again, I think these are fairly uh, optimistic compared to what I think um, will really happen. So what are our solutions? Because I really do want to say something nice, and I, I think also you have to give people hope. Um, the, First thing, I think we have to look at how do we decentralize our populations so they lower the cost of living and increase living space. The notion of the urbanists that we have to force everybody into smaller and smaller space in order to have more and more space that's, that's not used, I think is kind of anti-human to the extreme. We can figure out ways of having nature thrive and humans thrive at the same time. And unfortunately, we are now in a kind of uh, era that might even be called either neo-Druid or, um, or uh, um, neo-pagan, uh, in which we actually think that nature has supremacy over humanity. I think humanity clearly has to live with nature, but we have to think about how do we make it possible so that people will make the decision they can have kids. Where we find is, the birth rates in lower density communities 
are considerably higher. So people may come and live in the urban core, let's say Manhattan, when they're young, and as they get married, they will move out to places that can accommodate families. So I'm very much in the idea of um, Ebenezer Howard, the, the great uh, British town planner, about the garden city, about combining nature and work and humanity. We really have to think about the city as a human organism, not as something in order to increase real estate speculation or to allow architects to build big buildings which they dream of. How do we build cities so that they serve people? Um, and then all of this goes uh, with the idea of focusing on the family as a prime spiritual value of civilization. Uh, th this was a, a Ebenezer Howard said, town and country must be married, and out of this joyous union will spring a new hope, a new life, a new civilization. And I think we've seen examples of, in, particularly in the US, UK, in Australia, of how this could possibly be done. We have to also think about the opportunities of technology. Um, people working at home where possible so that you remove the, I, the idea that you have to go 30, 40 minutes to get to work and you come back in a bad mood, whether you're in the train or whether you're driving. We have to think about this sort of new kind of, uh, of, of city, which actually harkens back to the great um, Dutch cities of, of the 17th century, where people uh, uh, usually ran their business downstairs, family lived upstairs. Um, so I just want to just leave you with one major thing, which is we have to understand that family is at the center of things, but we have to construct our society in a way so that it is more possible for people to have families. As Shakespeare said, the voice of parents is the voice of gods, for to their children they are heaven's lieutenants. Thank you very much.